Great, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, so welcome this afternoon to the SOTA Data Science Center uh, Symposium. I'm Wayne Lutters, uh, Interim Co-Director of the Center here at the University of Maryland. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the SOTA website next week. Uh, transcription services are on. You can click your button if you would like to uh, follow along textually. Uh, and we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation but please use the Q&A feature at any time during the symposium to write your questions uh, behind the scenes. Jody Williams and I will be queuing them up for our two speakers today to make sure we can have a lively discussion at the end. Uh, if you'd like the opportunity to ask your questions live, please take a note of that and uh, we'll be you'll be called on and you can unmute during the Q&A session. Uh, so we have an engaging dialogue today between uh, both the academy and industry. Uh, we have Jen Goldbeck, who's a professor at the College of Information Studies here at the University of Maryland. Uh, professor Goldbeck's research focuses on artificial intelligence, social media, privacy, and trust on the web. She's also an active science communicator, speaking regularly with the media and at conferences about the most current events in tech. Uh, Jen Romano joins us as a senior uh, UX manager at Google and an instructor at UC Berkeley Extension. Uh, she's also an instructor here at the University of Maryland and a uh, UX research coach. She specializes in efficient applications of research methods to ensure that scientific rigor is not compromised while working fast to gain actionable results. Always a tough trade-off. Uh, Jen's research specializes in uh, usability, eye tracking, survey design, experimental design, cognitive aging as well. Uh, she's held UX positions in industry at Facebook, Instagram, Bridgewater Associates, Principles by Ray Dalio, Fours Marsh Group, and the US government at the US Census Bureau, and works as an independent consultant as well. Uh, so we'll start off with Jen Goldbeck uh, for our first of our two sessions. So please, questions Q&A. Uh, looking forward to learning more about UX and research methods. Jen. Thanks, Wayne. Let me uh, pull my slides up here and we'll get started. How's that look? Good? Awesome. Uh, so thanks, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, as Wayne said, a professor in the College of Information Studies. I'm a computer scientist by training, um, but have a lot of degrees and tendrils in other places. I'm really interested in the connection between computing and humans and all the different ways that those intersect with each other. And so today I thought I'd give beyond just my own work, a kind of high level overview of uh, the academic space where I am really excited about where data science and HCI interact. And I'll talk about some of my projects, but also some other people's work that I think is really exciting in that space. Um, so a lot of that for me comes down to user profiling. <laughs> and uh, that can, of course, be super creepy. And it's a thing that I worry about and sometimes keeps me up at night. Um, but it also can be really useful. And this is kind of the data science side. Um, you know, there's humans involved, obviously we're profiling them. Uh, but when I write papers about profiling users, just from like, here's how you compute this attribute about this person from their data, um, HCI venues typically are not super interested or they don't know what to do <laughs> about it. So uh, that said, neither do AI venues. It's one of those weird <laughs> intersecting things. Uh, but I think it's really exciting. And it's a place where you can do very interesting statistical analytics um, or machine learning uh, and get a lot of really interesting insights. And it requires both a good understanding of humans and whatever attributes you're trying to understand and then the technology to do that, which for me is like the sweet spot of like really interesting research. So um, some of the things that we can find out, I wanna just kind of paint a picture of what we can do when we're trying to profile users. Um, one is find out demographic information, race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, if people are drinkers or smokers or drug users, all of that kind of trait-based stuff uh, is things that we can profile quite easily about people from the data that they provide on social media, their purchase histories, um, information from their friends, all of this comes together. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that tech going forward. Um, 
Behavior is also a really interesting one that, that sort of overlaps with demographics. So I mentioned we can tell uh, like if people are drinkers or smokers. Um, we also can look at things like um, understanding where you're going to go next if we have a history of all the places that you've been. Um, and so we can know a lot about what you do with these methods. Um, your preferences, this is probably where you encounter this most often. So uh, when Netflix recommends shows for you to watch or when you're on social media and you have the customized feed, all of that is using information that we're inferring about your preferences and what's going to keep you engaged in order to help suggest new stuff to you that you're likely to enjoy. Um, and finally, you social connections. And these are really valuable. Again, you encounter these like on social media where it suggests friends to you. Um, that's basically inferring that you probably have a connection with this person, um, at least some of the time. And so when you put all of these together, we can get really deep insights into people and their behaviors and what they do. Um, so a couple examples, one research project that we did in my lab um, and that I also collaborated with Lisa Gatour, who's now at UC Santa Cruz on, um, was looking at people's alcoholism recovery process. So I had actually originally been interested in looking at DUI recidivism. Could we find people who had been arrested for a DUI, look at their social media data and predict if they would get another DUI? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, the problem from a data science perspective is that people tend not to tweet very much about their DUIs. So the data set's quite small. Um, we just couldn't find enough people that we had this information for. But it got me reading a lot of tweets from these people because I was looking on Twitter and uh, and looking at people who were having trouble with alcohol. And so I wondered, could we look at people who were trying to deal with their drinking issues and understand the likelihood of their success? So what we did is go to Twitter and we found everyone who said, I'm going to my first AA meeting tomorrow. So I think our search string was literally first AA meeting tomorrow. We got thousands of tweets that said this. Um, a lot of them were jokes. <laughs> so um, there's a, a kind of meme that a lot of people were passing around for a year with like a bunch of um, double A batteries standing in a circle with like a tiny coffee pot. So we obviously filtered all of those out. Um, there were people who were like in school to get degrees in social work or uh, counseling or some kind of therapy. And they would go to an AA meeting kind of to observe as part of their coursework. And so we also dropped them out. And so we ended up with hundreds of people who really were like, you know, my drinking is out of control. I'm going to my first AA meeting tomorrow, or uh, the court has ordered me to go to my first AA meeting tomorrow, or my parents are making me go to my first AA meeting tomorrow. But people who were going because they had drinking problems. Um, then we wanted to see, do they stay sober? And, and of course the question is how long? We don't, we can't look over the whole term of these people's lives, but 90 days is kind of a good marker point for early addiction recovery. You wanna at least try to make those first 90 days first. Um, so we wanted to see, did these people make it 90 days? And we did that by continuing to read their tweets. So we found that tweet that said they were going to their first AA meeting. And then we started looking after that at what they posted. So this was an entirely manual process for hundreds and hundreds of people um, to see if they said explicitly either way. So it could be they a year later posted that they were celebrating a year of sobriety. And though, then we know they made it 90 days. It could be a week later, they were complaining about being hung over at work. And so then we knew that they had gone back to drinking. So we had explicit information for everybody in our data set. If for some reason there was no indication either way, which was rare, we threw those people out. So we made sure we had pretty solid ground truth for all of these people. So we knew that they went to AA, we knew if they stayed sober for 90 days. And then what we did is collect everything that they had done on Twitter before they announced they were going to that first AA meeting. So we collected all of their tweets, all of their social interactions, their profile information, and tried to do some quantification with that so we could build a predictive model. Basically, on the day you announce you're going to your first AA meeting, can we analyze everything you have on Twitter to predict if you'll stay sober 90 days? Now, the traditional way that you would do this with like machine learning um, is kind of throw everything in and maybe like run it through some things to create features. 
dump it all into your machine learning algorithm and see what comes out on the other side. And of course, that tends to work really well, but it doesn't give you any insight. Um, and for this project, if we're going to tell people, we'll, we'll talk in a minute, we don't actually share this tool with anybody, but if you were to use this tool and it will be like, nope, looks like it's not going to work, like that's not very helpful. That's just discouraging. So could we build a model that actually was sort of explainable that would be able to tell you here is the dominant feature that helped us make that decision and that dominant feature would make sense. So the way that we built this model is not the way it's normally done in machine learning, but we went to the addiction literature and looked for what are the attributes that people have that either makes it easier or makes it more difficult to recover from addiction. So that could be things like things you can't control, like did you become an alcoholic before you were 21? Um, if you did, you have a much harder time staying sober than if you became an alcoholic as an adult. Um, are you in a social circle full of people who drink all the time? So kind of offline, if you're going out with people who are drinking a lot, it makes it harder for you to stay sober. So we were kind of like, how do we measure that online? And what we decided to do was just look at how many people that you're kind of mutuals with on Twitter talk about drinking a lot. We built a dictionary of drinking related words to, to kind of get a measure of how often they talked about that. Another like really predictive thing is uh, what your coping style is. So there's, I think, eight or 10 different coping styles that generally fall into the good and bad or adaptive and maladaptive categories. Um, adaptive coping styles mean when you're faced with stress, you do things that help you productively deal with that. They tend to fall into two categories. Either you get social support because you just, there's no other, there's no way to solve the problem. Like if um, somebody in your life died, you can't do anything about the fact that they died, but it may be really stressful and difficult. So you can look for social support to help you deal with that. Uh, the other is sort of trying to solve the problem that's at the core of the stress. So there's somebody you work with who's being a jerk to you. How do you actually solve that problem? And there's lots of ways to do that. But if that's how you deal with your stress, like that tends to be adaptive. Maladaptive coping strategies include things like kind of ignoring the problem and pretending it's not there. So um, this is actually really common in people with PTSD. They'll have... Um, you know, strong memories of something that they don't want to remember and they avoid thinking about it. And that tends to lead towards PTSD or at least be a common trait among people who have that. Um, and it's also just trying to do things to forget about the problem. So there's a person at work who's being a jerk to you and then you go out and get drunk after work so you don't have to think about it anymore. The problem is still there when you sober up and the drinking is just a way to avoid dealing with the problem. So we know that alcoholics tend to have maladaptive coping styles, um, but how do you figure that out on Twitter? Our answer was we went and built a, and wrote a separate paper on inferring people's coping styles from Twitter. So we actually had them take psychological surveys to get their coping style, analyze the text that they posted. And there's an incredibly strong signal that shows how you deal with stress that comes through in your text. So the output of that coping model then went into the alcoholism model. So we did a lot of things like that. And at the end, what we found out is using these pretty understandable features that come from the addiction literature, our model could predict if someone would stay sober with about 85% accuracy, just by looking at what they had done on Twitter. So on the day you decide you're gonna to go to AA, we can push a button and tell you if it's gonna work or not. And unlike a lot of machine learning models, we can give you an idea of what the major things are that are likely to prevent you from being successful. And if possible, tell you some ways that you can fix that. So you can get therapy to work on your coping styles, you can change up your social circle and so on. So that is one example of about five hours of material that I have on different ways that we can use AI and social data to profile users. Um, but I'm gonna kind of leave it at that to just be like, that's a lot of what we can do. Um, and then move on to like, what's the HCI side of this? So we tend to have those user profiling tools. And then the question becomes, what do we do with that from the HCI side? And, and most of the ways that that ends up working is in personalization. Um, I do a lot of work in recommender systems. So this is things like Netflix recommending shows to you. Um, 
that's unlikely to use your likelihood of recovering from alcoholism, but it certainly uses information like what genres of movies do you like? What do people who are similar to you like? What are your friends like? And how does that all feed in so we can make suggestions? Uh, accessibility is another one. So if we can tell from your data that you maybe have difficulty processing certain kinds of information, for example, we can present information to you in a personalized way that makes it more accessible. Um, of course, in your lives, this is done a lot with your social feeds. So uh, what you see depends on all of these things that are inferred about you. And a lot of times there's just a model on the back end, um, and the other gen can probably tell you a lot about this, that, that just doesn't give any reasons, but is like, yeah, this is a thing that looks like you're probably likely to engage with, and it, it bumps that up. Um, and then finally, motivation. So if we know what sorts of things you engage with and are responsive to, we can use that to actually help motivate you or get you interested in using an interface, um, keep you coming back to that interface. Gamification is a great example of this. Um, and if we can personalize that gamification, that can really help. So for example, if you want to exercise more, um, I could build an awesome app to help you exercise more, but is it actually using something that you're responsive to? Um, so there's a, a lot of really interesting research on like, how do you motivate people to do things like that in a gaming environment, gamified environment? Um, and there's different things. So some people really like social support um, where other people are cheering them on. Some people really like competition. Uh, some people like individual challenges. I'm one of those people, like, I don't care what other people in the whatever miles run challenge you're doing. I certainly don't need people telling me I'm doing a good job. Um, but if you give me like a gold star, if I hit a threshold, then I'm like absolutely gonna do that. And so you can use personalization to figure out what are the kind of things that people are responsive to and highlight that to get them motivated to engage. Um, the fact is that there's like full conferences worth of material on all of the ways that we can leverage personalization. Um, or leverage all those outputs from data science on people's things to personalize for them. Um, and, and I think it's a really beautiful space of being able to leverage these fascinating AI results in the HCI space to build interfaces that are better for people. Of course, this can also go super creepy, right? Uh, but hopefully you're all going to do it in ways that are like ethical and respectful and like really building a better user experience for people. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that and stop sharing my screen. Um, and Wayne, I'll let you pass it over to the other Jen. I think you're muted, Wayne. Yes, so Jen, do appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and let's continue the story with uh, Jen. You can cue your slides up. And look at this context in which those things can be applied. Please keep the questions coming. We have a number in the Q&A block already. As they come to your mind, capture them. We will sort them and queue them up at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. And thank you, Jen. Um, so I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction here. I'm going to talk about UX research and industry. And let's start by um, thinking about how important it is to understand our user's experience. Our user's experience is not our experience. Oftentimes, people will create things and think they know what other people need based on what their needs and what their expectations are. But it's really impossible to know how other people use products. And, so, and it's impossible to understand how they interact and how they feel unless we actually go and talk to them. So it's important because we're not them. So for example, let's imagine Sue, an engineer in New York City. And these are actually engineers that I worked with when I was at Facebook. Um, imagine there's Sue in New York City and she's designing an app and this app is intended to be for everyone. And let's say this app is aimed at helping people during emergencies. It helps them connect with people. It helps them share resources. And Sue and her colleagues are creating this app, trying to figure out exactly how to design this and what features this app should have. But she's never actually been in an emergency, the type of emergency that this app is for. She can imagine an earthquake because friends of hers have experienced earthquakes in San Francisco, but how about floods? Can she really know what it's like to be in a flood situation? Can she really know what it's like to use an app during a flood, during this kind of an emergency? Uh, does she really know what's important, what needs she might have during a flood? 
And then how about tornadoes? Can she really know what it's like to live through a tornado and to know what's important, who to contact, what information to share, um, what information she might need right after a tornado or right after a wildfire? Um, sorry, my dog is making some noises outside. Um, and then imagine using a feature phone. So imagine being in a country where they don't have the modern phones that we might have. And um, she doesn't know how to use those kinds of phones because she's never used these types of phones. Or what about trying to engage when there's poor electricity or poor internet connectivity um, or in an environment where people lose electricity for weeks during an emergency? Um, it's really impossible to imagine these things and to really experience what those things are like. And then take it one step further. What about people who have low literacy or people who are brand new to using smartphones? All of these things are really impossible for an engineer, for a designer, uh, for people who are working on building these apps to really imagine and understand as they create. Um, and then again, thinking about other cultures, uh, for example, some research I conducted in rural Indo Indonesia um, in a small little village where there's really poor in internet connectivity and people are using smartphones in different ways than we use here. They're using them to connect and, and share the goods they're, um, they're producing rather than connecting you know, in, in social ways in, that we do uh, that is normal to us. So when we conduct user experience research, it really enables us to learn about the people we're building for, to understand them, to understand their experiences. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, little kind of fun graphics about the importance of understanding users. There's a lot of research that goes into understanding clients and how to sell to clients, how to market to people so they will buy products, but that's not enough. So let's take a look, for example, at a baby mobile that is marketed to parents of the baby. This makes sense because parents are the ones who are going to purchase the mobile, not the babies. The parents here are the clients, but the parents, like the designers of the mobile, are not the users. And maybe a lot of research is conducted with the parents. The parents really love the baby mobile, and their view of the product is really, really great. They see these little zoo animals going around in circles, their faces, their bodies, it's really cute and music is playing and they love it. But were the user's needs actually taken into account? The user sees this view. The baby actually sees the, the little animal's butts and tails, not the animal's faces going around in, in a circle. So this is a classic example. You know, another thing we can think about is like business products where, um, the research may go into who is buying the products for a company, for an, or an organization, but not enough research is conducted with the people who are actually using the products and understanding what their needs are um, and what their, uh, what their experiences are. So it's not enough to conduct research with uh, the clients, with the purchasers. We want to make sure we're conducting research with the people who are actually using the products. And oftentimes when research is cut out of the process, organizations add what I call band-aids to they add these later to attempt to fix the issues. And early research can really help us to avoid this. So take, for example, this is an actual ticket machine that I encountered exiting a parking garage, and I had to figure out exactly how to use a machine. Clearly research was not conducted on this product. Um, you can see that there are, they tried to, overcome some of these issues by adding numbers, you know, the order that you're supposed to do this in, they've added um, arrows, they've added instructions, they've highlighted it with green, with yellow, with red, all trying to get people to be able to use this product, to be able to pay for the parking ticket and exit the parking garage. But it ends up actually being more complicated. You know, you're trying to exit a parking garage. Do you have the, the time to figure this machine out. It's supposed to be a pretty easy, usable product, right? Put the ticket in, put the money in, and be able to uh, leave the parking garage, exit the parking lot. And then now imagine the stress that it can occur if you've, you know, who knows where you're coming from or where you're going to. And now you have a line of cars behind you and you're trying to get out of that parking garage and all you're trying to do is pay that parking ticket. It could be really problematic. It could be really stressful to you, to the people around you. So 
These kinds of things can happen when research is forgotten. These band-aids are added to help users, but it's actually not helpful at all to the end users. So why do we care? Because we're not our users and understanding us, the people around us and the clients, it's really not enough. We need to go to our users to understand what their needs are. Now, we want to talk about methods, of course. There's a number of methods we use in industry to conduct UX research. And the way we like to think about them, the way I like to think about them is qualitative versus quantitative, and then attitudes and behaviors. So you need to, before planning your, your research project, think about what you're aiming to learn. And these are some of the classic methods we use um, in um, UX research. This certainly is not all of them, but these are um, um, the, the classics. Um, so for example, up here in the right-hand corner, we have eye tracking. This is really at the intersection of behavior and quantitative, where um, we can have visualizations that tend to be more qualitative, but we can also have quantitative data, which might include things like the number of times people looked at something, the total number of fixations, or the time it takes people to first look at something, to have a fixation in a certain area. And we can examine this type of data across participants. We can um, run statistical analyses to better understand differences among groups or among uh, parts of the screen that you're trying to assess um, the, the type of attention they gather. And we can measure behavior. So what people are actually looking at when they're engaging with a product. Um, surveys are very classic uh, UX, a uh, very classic UX research method. Uh, largely quantitative, largely attitudinal. When we conduct surveys, we're asking people what they think, how they feel, um, and we really want to understand widespread the attitudes um, that people have. We sometimes use surveys more qualitatively, like with smaller samples, but um, usually when we have smaller samples and we want qualitative uh, feedback, we have some of these other um, methodologies here. So I'll go into a couple of these in detail. I have some examples of some um, industry research studies that I've been a part of. So uh, let me start with a, um, a project from Facebook. And here is a study that was aimed at understanding a solving and solving a problem. And it was, um, it was I, I was the researcher on this product and I worked with a number of other roles, which I think is also important to highlight. We rarely operate in isolation. So um, in this project here, um, I partnered with various teams, uh, various team members on the privacy team. I was the UX researcher on the privacy team. And in this situation, we had conflicting observations from the data scientists on the one hand and the engineers on the other hand. So they brought me in to say, what, what's going on with this data? There's a mismatch here. So the data scientists discovered what settings people were using and when they were changing settings. So this is the analytics, the data that is being collected based on how people are using a product. So data scientists knows what people are using when they're, when they're using these settings. And according to the data scientist, people used privacy settings because we had data showing that people used privacy settings. Data showed that they clicked on certain settings frequently, that they clicked on the screens that had these privacy settings. So if we only looked at that data, we would make the assumption that people are using privacy settings. However, the engineers reported that there were lots of complaints about privacy. And in some of our bug reports, people were complaining about, the pri about privacy and the inability to locate certain privacy settings. So this is where that disconnect was. So um, we weren't really sure what the issue was at this point. Uh, so we worked together to think about how we could take these existing insights, these competing insights, and, and learn more about what was actually going on. So brought me on, and I conducted qualitative and quantitative UX research to uh, better understand a number of things. So we really wanted to understand this mismatch, this incomplete picture, understand what was going on. We had a number of research questions, starting with um, understanding what were the concerns. So this is even before they click on privacy settings, what's going on? What are the privacy concerns and how do they address these concerns? And, um, and then we want to know, of course, where do they click when they have these concerns? From there, we wanted to take that a little bit further and understand 
if they could find those settings that they were looking for. And once they found them, did they understand the privacy settings? And then, of course, the overall experience. How do they feel about this overall experience? Sorry, my dog is so loud right now. Um, so we use a number of different methods, and these are just a few examples here. Um, so we did first click studies. You can see these little red dots here. We showed people um, screenshots and asked, where would you click to address the concern? And that's what the red dot is depicting, where people said they would click to address their privacy concerns. So this was insight number one. You could see they're all over the place. So sure, some people could find their privacy settings, but others could not. They're, they're picking other places that they would click. So now this makes sense that the data scientists thought, hey, people are finding their privacy settings. We, we're showing that people are clicking into this page, but now we're seeing this other issue. All those other people that are clicking elsewhere, the data scientist was missing that information. Um, he was able to, to, to indicate um, how many clicks were in the correct place, but he wouldn't be able to know people were clicking in the incorrect places. Um, so that was one big insight. And then we conducted a number of surveys to understand what those concerns were and how people felt about their experience in the lab, in in-person studies. Um, we aim to dig a little bit deeper. We included eye tracking to better understand where people looked uh, before they clicked, once they clicked, where did they look when they received uh, various privacy prompts? Were they reading the prompts? Did they understand the prompts? Um, things like this. And these are just, again, a little sampling of the various methods we used. And we used an iterative process, which means when we learned something, we conducted more research on top of that to continue um, evolving and iterating the process and the product. And ultimately what happened is based on this iterative process, changes were made and new products were created. So the new products that were created weren't simply revamping the privacy settings page, which we also did. That's pretty common. We learn something and we, we fix, we modify an existing product. But in addition, we created new products that met users where they were. So instead of now expecting people to know exactly where to go to find those privacy settings at any given time, we now gave them these prompts. You may have seen these before on Facebook, where now it says, hey, you just changed this thing. You might be interested in checking your privacy settings. Click here to go and change your privacy settings. So now we revise where users were even getting this information. Again, instead of expecting them to know exactly where to go to find those privacy settings, we met them where they were. Are we on time? All right, so let me share another example of UX research to improve data collection and data dissemination. And this, these are examples from when um, I was at the US Census Bureau. So the US Census Bureau um, conducts a number of surveys and partners with different organizations to collect data about the population. Um, there are apps, um, web versions of surveys, there are paper surveys, lots of surveys that are coming out of the Census Bureau. And this is just an example of what one might look like on a smartphone. And you can see, not very usable, really tiny text. So some of our work was better understanding how to display the survey on full screen versus app versus paper. Um, one study I worked on was for the non-response follow-up enumerator questionnaire. And this is basically for people who do not respond to the decennial census, the census that is every 10 years. If you don't respond, someone will come to your door and take a census of people living in the home. And this was on paper. And there were a number of different pieces of paper that went along with this. So in our study at the Census Bureau in our lab, we had both the people who were responding to the survey, but we also had the mod, the um, the, um, oh, I'm totally blanking on what's called, the moderator, the person who's conducting the interview. We needed them to participate in the study too to make sure they could use the instrument. So it wasn't just about the person responding, but about the person who was collecting the information as well. And there were a number of things, um, number of pieces of paper, literally, that were involved in the study. What you see on the screen here is this information sheet that the 
interviewer would hand to the person at the door to make sure the person at the door knows who to include and who not to include when they're giving the count of how many people were in the household. So we tested this sheet, we tested this big trifold paper sheet uh, where the interviewer would actually collect the data. And uh, we wanted to make sure people understood that people could accurately count the people in their house and that the interviewer could, could accurately record that information. And we learned something really interesting that was unexpected, unintended about this, um, the way this, this big sheet, um, the way people interacted with this big sheet. So we had them in the lab stand in a certain spot and we had a camera overhead to record what they were doing. And this was important because we want the lab environment to mimic the real world environment. What we don't want to do in the lab is have them sit down at a nice clean table where they can spread out and because that's not what it's like when you're standing at someone's door trying to ask a person about the the people that were in the household so what we found you can see in these pictures is that this large three trifold paper was actually pretty unwieldy and difficult to hold during these interviews and the interviewers were folding the sheets back which had a potential to interfere with the data collection because these sheets are then fed through um, a machine that then reads all the data, everything they've recorded. And now there are these additional creases on the sheet that have the potential to impact uh, the, the data, uh, the way the data is recorded. Um, so we uncovered something completely different and that was only by, again, mimicking exactly how people stand at the doorway. We had to mimic that in the lab. Um, so that's a that's a consideration when we're conducting UX research. We want to make sure we're mimicking that environment so we can learn things like this that we don't even set out to learn. Um, at the Census Bureau, we've conducted research all the way up to the data dissemination. So this is, I don't even think this site is there anymore, um, but obviously they collect a lot of data and then they need to disseminate all that data and make sure that anyone, the average person, can easily find information about the population, which is what they're there for. Um, and that's just an example of a paper. Okay, one other project I wanted to share with you um, is um, work I did at Instagram. And this one is a little bit different because it wasn't it wasn't the classic improving a product like these other examples I shared with you. This was more understanding users' perceptions. So when I was at Instagram, I worked with an engineering team. And the engineering team was interested in improving how the app runs, the performance of the app. So we um, studied things like, you may have seen some of these, these kinds of screens on Instagram, if you're an Instagram user, frankly, on any app, because we see these sometimes, these spinners. And we wanted to better understand what did people think was happening? Were they blaming the app? Were they blaming internet? Um, wh what were they blaming? Were they blaming their phone? And then what did they do? Like how frustrating was this experience and how did it ultimately impact their perceptions of the product or their usage? These were just some of the questions we were interested in. Um, so these are some just some survey examples here where we found that we asked people about slow loading photos and what they thought were happening, uh, what they thought was happening. And for example, people thought that slow loading photos used more data, which is not correct. So we were able to then, the engineers then took this information to see how we could modify that slightly to make people feel better about the experience and um, have a, have a um, 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 what do I wanna say? Um, not have this disconnect in what was taking place um, what they thought was taking place and what was actually taking place, the, the point of photos using more data. Um, so we, we modified um, some, some screens similar to what you see here, showing a bit of a photo in the back versus showing no photo. What impact did these have on um, perceptions? And, um, and then we were able to assess if those impacted people's perceptions of more data being used. We also conducted a diary study uh, where we asked people to log over a period of time anytime they had an issue. So anytime the app crashed or it was unresponsive or things weren't loading. And then we were able to take all of this data to find what the what we called the worst offenders, what the um, 
what the um, worst performance issues were for users. We asked them to log the issue, to take screenshots, to describe what was happening, what they were trying to do, and then ultimately what happened. And then we asked them to log their mean frustration and their hindrance, whether or not they could accomplish their task. Then we sorted these, and this is how we were able to find those worst offenders. So again, a little bit different from our classic uh, UX research where we're improving more like the visual of what people see and interact with and understand. This was more behind the scenes, the performance of the app. And then um, real quick, another quick study, just another example of how we use UX research. Um, when I was at Bridgewater and, and Principles, we were taking tools that were used internally. Um, you may have heard about these before. Uh, Bridgewater has a culture of radical truth and transparency. And one of the tools they use internally is called a dot collector. Um, might look something like this where you can um, provide feedback to your colleagues at any time. Um, and it's pretty transparent. And you give feedback based on any attributes, there's a number of attributes. So you, you might give me feedback right now live about uh, my presentation skills and maybe the attribute is clear and concise or something like this. And you select the attribute and you give a numerical rating and then you give qualitative information about it. So you're getting feedback, giving and receiving feedback all the time. And that's the Bridgewater culture. But what we found when we took this product externally was that there was a barrier Prior to using a product, it wasn't simply enough to teach people how to use this product. There was a cultural barrier. People needed to first understand how to give and receive feedback, how to do so kindly, how to do so in a way that was valuable for all parties involved. Um, so that was a different way of, of a different thing we learned. We set out to understand the usability of the product and how to better the product but then ultimately we found this other issue that was more of a cultural um, barrier to usage. So again, just to recap, lots of different methods and, and depending on what we aim to learn, we select our methods. Um, I'm very much a proponent of mixed methods. Rarely do I just use one method in isolation because even as you can see from the few things I've shared here, we tend to learn different things from different methods. So, um, uh, yeah, depending on what you want to learn, you select your methods, use a mixed method approach to get a well-rounded picture of the user's experience. Thank you. Great, Jen, thank you very much. Uh, to the audience, uh, please keep the questions coming. We have a couple that are already in queue. And so what I will do is let me start off uh, Jen Romano with some direct follow-on questions. And then we'll head over to Jen Goldbeck and we'll hopefully have some fun synthesis questions that are appearing in, in the interim. So Jen, here's a, here's a two-parter. Uh, Omena is particularly interested in how you map particular research methods to particular kinds of technologies, products, and design. And Amanda's curious as to who makes the decision of fit how much of that is the researcher and designer like yourself? How much are managers or higher ups already decided? So a question about fit and who decides. Great questions. Um, I, I, hmm. Honestly, I feel like this gets easier with experience, right? We have our basic, I shouldn't say basic, our classic research methods that are the bread and butter of our industry. Um, I mentioned surveys and diary studies, and then in-depth interviews and usability testing. Like these are the ones we use classic to understand how people are interacting with products and how to make those products better. And, you know, at, at its core, what we're doing is understanding what works well, what doesn't work well, how to make it better. And then we collaborate with the designers and developers. There isn't a, um, like, I don't get sign off when I decide on a, on a method you know, I, I don't um, need to go and get somebody to approve that because I've been in the field long enough. I think when you're getting started, you work with your teammates, your your um, peers, your manager, whomever you're working with to help fine tune that. But then, you know, with time that that just becomes second nature, you have the methods you use, which is not to say I know everything. I keep myself fresh. I go to conferences. I'm out there seeing what other people are working on. I love collaborating with academics. Academics tend to have the, the latest and greatest and, you know, are doing the, the more rigorous, in my opinion, research because in industry, we're moving so fast. 
you know, so like I'm, I'm keeping myself fresh as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that, if that, um, answered that question just about how we're, um, how we're selecting methods. I don't think there's a, um, I mean, those are really the classic methods too. It's not like we're choosing certain ones for a certain type of product, you know, whether it's like digital or paper, it's still those classic usability and in-depth interviews that we're using. Right. And how much freedom do you have for choosing from that palette and how much is already decided for you? Lots of freedom, lots of freedom. Now I imagine, I'm trying to think in all the places I've worked, if there has been some, the, the thing that might make you go in one direction or another is, you know, if a tool costs money and you don't have the budget. So like eye tracking, for example, you need eye tracking equipment. Right. So that might, you might, you might think you really want to understand attention. So eye tracking is really important, but you just don't have the budget and you can't get buy-in from, um, you know, senior folks at the company who have access to the pocketbook. <laughs> um, but otherwise there's really liberty to what you choose, you know, as a researcher, that's your job. You're hired to do the research. So, uh, a PM, an engineer, a designer, they're not going to tell you what method to use. If so, that's that's kind of out of scope for them, just like you wouldn't tell a designer what product to use to make designs, right? Like as a researcher, that is your role. So it should be um, pretty liberal in, in the ability to choose what method works best for your research questions. Hey, great. Thank you. Uh, Jen Goldbeck, a user profile and captured people's imaginations. Uh, and also triggered a bunch of concerns about what might not work well here. Uh, the first question is, we have Avina asking, when you're dealing with tough issues like DUI analyzing, how do you work to eliminate bias in marginalized communities? Specifically, how can you work to limit racial profiling in unlawful actions like DUIs? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question and a huge problem. Um, there is not an answer to it at this point. There's a lot of people working on a lot of answers to it, um, but but the problems come in a few places, right? Um, the, main, the main source of that is where do we get our data from, right? And, and the information itself may be biased. So, so say I'm looking at Twitter to get this information. Um, that's biased, like not everybody's on Twitter. And in fact, you know, if we're talking about racial stuff, black people are overrepresented on Twitter compared to their representation in the general population. So if everybody who got a DUI tweeted about it, we would have more black people in our sample and that could potentially bias the algorithm. Uh, a bigger problem, like you can kind of account for that and manage that in your data. But a bigger problem is that it's likely that Black people are getting pulled over and given DUIs more than white people who are also driving drunk, right? It's not that they're committing the crime more often. It's that they're getting charged with it more often. Um, and, and we see that all the time. Um, and then, you know, there are recidivism prediction tools out there now. Um, there were not when I started this project. I probably started this in like 2015, 16, started like looking to get this data. Um, and then it took a bunch of years to actually get some results out. In the interim, there are tools now that predict your risk of recidivism and they're in use. Uh, so in the state of Florida, where I am right now, they use these tools to determine if people should be let out on bail or if they should be paroled. They are profoundly racially biased. Um, it's established that they're racially biased and they're still in use. And they consider factors like essentially how much money does your family have? And like on one hand, of course, that's going to be related to recidivism. Like if you are going out of jail back into poverty, there's reasons, one, that you'll be in environments where you're more likely to be arrested, you know, and two, like the resources to keep you out of trouble, if you're likely to get into trouble, are smaller than if you're going back into a really wealthy household. On the same time, at the same time, do we want to have two 17-year-olds who get arrested for possession of marijuana one being let out on bail because he has rich parents and one not being let out on bail because his parents aren't rich. Like that seems problematic and not how we want to be making these decisions, even though the algorithm itself is not necessarily wrong, right? Even if it is the case that you're more likely to say 
say, let's give all benefits of the doubt that you are more likely to commit another crime, not just get arrested, but say commit another crime if you have a poor family versus a rich family. Do we still want that to be the thing? Like there's some clear racism going on in there because there's racism in society. So there's not a clear kind of data science way to be like, oh, you just balance your classes or you add like an additional penalty when your machine learning algorithm infers this because the sources you're collecting the data from are biased, the societal forces that are producing the outcomes that feed that data are biased, and like objective reality of living in this society is also biased. And we don't want algorithms to just be reinforcing and echoing that bias, we would love it if they could help us make the world a fairer, more equitable place. But it's it's like you run into this, this conundrum of like, I can't fix society. So what do I do with my algorithm? And, you know, I, I think a really important thing that this highlights, and a thing that drives me crazy, is that a lot of computer scientists think that there are just technical solutions to social problems. And I am a computer scientist and I get in fights with them. I, I went to a conference once, I promise I'll keep this short. I gave the keynote at the IUI conference, Intelligent User Interfaces. And I was cornered after that talk by a professor who I'll just make the side note, gave me a really mean interview when I was on the job market to become a professor, but he really wanted my attention because he had written a book about how now that we had this great AI, there was not going to be any war or poverty or economic problems. And I was like, those seem like really big problems that people have been working on for a long time. He's like, yeah, but they weren't as smart as us because we have AI. And I was like, man, like you don't know what you're talking about at all, right? But there's this hubris of like, I don't need to actually understand these social problems. I just have tech and I'm going to apply it and we will live in a utopia. And um you know, a lot of the tech that we run into that has these bias problems is because there's like computer scientists and engineers building it without those people with really good understanding of very complicated social problems. Um, so, you know, there's not an easy answer to the question, but it highlights, I think, real importance of having multidisciplinary teams like from the humanities to the tech end involved in trying to figure out how to implement this fairly. Hey, great, thank you. Uh, so Marissa's curious uh, in this situation of how you protect data privacy and personal control of information when you're doing user profiling. And a question for both of you from this are, are subjects informed how their online presence is being used and the data you've collected that's going into the product design? How much agency do people have in this as participants? Yeah, I mean, Jen and I will probably have really different answers to this because like I'm governed by, you know, on all of us here in academia are governed by an IRB that requires very explicit like consent to participate in this. Now, that said, we're allowed to use public data without consent, right? If you post something on Twitter, I don't have to send you a form to consent for me to use it. I can just use that. Um, we're still figuring out the privacy element. I think we all care very much. Um, and try very hard to protect that, but we keep catching problems. Um, so, you know, one example of this is there was this really nice study on predicting postpartum depression using Twitter data. So they followed pregnant women um, and they included tweets in the paper and the New York Times reverse searched those tweets to find the authors and then went and interviewed them. And the women whose tweets they were had no idea that their tweets were used in this study because it was a public data study. So now we obfuscate text so it can't be reverse searched like that. Um, and it's like, even though that data was public, that feels really bad that that happened, right? So we're still sorting out what the rules are with that. And of course, in industry, and, and Jen Romano can talk to this, you know, you're not held by the same kind of ethics board review stuff that we are in academia. And it wouldn't necessarily work that way, but it creates that, I think, some tension there. Yeah, certainly tension. And I mean, we hear about this all the time. These big tech companies are in the news, you know, about how their data is used, how people's data is used. And, and it's something we are, we deal with, you know, as researchers, how much information do people want? Uh, where do they want that information? People want to know how their data is collected, how their data is being used, you know, so that is, that's some of what we're doing in industry is figuring out exactly what people want, how to give it to them, what, what does transparency mean, right? Does it mean 
letting people know exactly how everything works. Probably not because there's a lot of technical stuff that people don't understand and you don't want people to feel stupid, right? But it's like a fine line of like, people want the information, how much information, um, you know, and especially when it comes to how data is being used. Which is a good follow on to uh, Anne Marie's question around, uh, we'll start with Jen Romano on this one of, so sampling, how do you recruit participants for your UX research projects and how do you ensure the sample is reasonably representative for the goals you have and the questions you wanna answer? Yeah, great question. Um, it depends on um, what we're studying. So oftentimes for, with, when you're internal at a company like Google or Facebook or um, any company really where you're, where you're working on improving those products, uh, we have internal recruiters, you know, any of these companies, you may have been contacted by companies to participate in research studies, you know, that could be um, Target, they're trying to improve their e-commerce platform. Um, so companies have their own lists of users, so you might get emails to participate in research studies. Um, when we don't have access to these kinds of lists, we partner with external recruiting firms. So like focus group facilities, for example, they have the actual physical space, but they also have lists of people who have opted into being contacted, people who want to participate in research. So we might partner with them. Um, there's lots of different sampling mechanisms. We might use snowball sampling. If we are or have a hard to recruit population, we might recruit, um, you know, let's imagine uh, doctors or, or um, some population that's hard to recruit. We might recruit some and then ask them to share it with others. And we kind of have this um, snowball sampling. So lots of different methods. You know, if we used to do, I don't know if people are doing this any day, if people are doing this anymore. We used to literally in coffee shops, put little flyers with like the little things you rip off at the bottom. You know, so if you're trying to get people in a certain area, that might be a good method. On, on school campuses, that's probably still a good methodology where you can like put things around campus to re recruit people to participate in research studies. Great, uh, a question, uh, Jen, from Adam, uh, basically dealing with the fact that we are constantly under uh, surveillance and we know that we have profiles being built about us all the time uh, and would like to believe it's for our benefit but we look around at society and we see lots of things like increased polarization, decreasing trust, uh, bad trends in health, including, you know, deaths of despair, economic inequality. Is there any connection here, right? Are some of these tools that are really advantageous for advancing science and advancing uh, user design potentially harmful for society? Way to give me like 90 seconds to answer that question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's a fair question. Um, you know, on one hand, it's like very easy to focus on like the clear harms and inequalities that can come out of this kind of tech and not remember that it it does an amazing thing to bring people together. And I think I'm sort of like the youngest person who remembers life without having that kind of connection. Um, and just like how profoundly isolated it you could be living in a community and not with people who were like you before. So, so I don't want to, to just label it like, oh, it's all bad. That said, I am deeply interested in this question of like the psychology of surveillance and like, what is it actually doing to us to have, to know that we're just being monitored and followed and collected data on all the time. And that there's this degradation of privacy for sure. There is, a, I'm actively working on this and there's very little research on like the psychological impacts of being surveilled all the time. So, um, you know, if anybody wants to work on that for the next five years, like come talk to me because there's about 20 dissertations worth of research to be done there. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, just like a two second version there, there is also generational differences, like younger people tend to not care that their data is being collected. They want to know how their data is used, whereas Whereas like the generation before do not want their data collected. So there's lots of work to be done there. Right, a final synthesis question for us. Uh, Amanda is interested in your career arcs, right? So as you're both interested in doing uh, user-centered research, how your path that brought you to Instagram, Facebook, and Google, uh, Jen Romano, and a choice to stay in the academy and kind of speak to industry, uh, Jen Goldbeck. 
so I will say for me that I um, I still am an academic at heart, which um, like as Wayne was saying, my one of my specialties is like keeping up the rigor while moving quickly in industry. So if you are interested in both, I think that's a really nice sweet spot to be in. Uh, obviously, I'm a little bit biased. Um, and I and I still think about going back to academia full time. Like we'll we'll see, you know, as my career continues to evolve where that goes. But I um, stumbled into big tech. You know, when I was in when I was in grad school and got my PhD, I was doing an internship at the Census Bureau, and kind of one thing led to another. But I was always a bit entrepreneurial, so I was interested in business. And when I discovered that research is conducted in business, that to me was like this nice marriage of the research and um and, and entrepreneur and business um but really if i had to to sum it up my the way i got here was really being open-minded like i'm open to experiences i have been given i've been lucky enough to have been at these jobs or at conferences networking where i've met people who are in these positions where i'm like oh that sounds interesting you know i might be interested in that and then i just try it you know, and that's kind of why I've bounced around a little bit because you know, I continue to try for that matter. <laughs> uh, I'll go real quick. I never left school, like since kindergarten, <laughs> I've just been in school. Um, I mean, I flirted not so much with industry, uh, but with public service. So I've done some work in the intelligence community. I interned there and was interested, um, but I really like the freedom to be able to do whatever I want. And when I interviewed in industry, I felt like I'd be a little driven by, you know, what the business needs were. And I was like, don't tell me what to do. And so you can be like that in academia. And that, that's why I will probably always stay. Hey, marvelous. And the fluid opportunities to move between them. Thank you both for engaging conversations and getting us to think about the user in the foreground. Uh, this is the last of our SOTA Symposium for uh, this academic year. We thank you for your engagement across these past few months. If you'd like to receive notifications about upcoming events, please join our listserv. And uh, this video will be available on the website probably next week. Jen Romano, Jen Golbeck, thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you.